Hello, my name is Rick Pearson and welcome to Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, last week we talked about the falling away of America from her Judeo-Christian roots. However, just because Babylon falls, it doesn't mean that you have to. In fact, it just may mean the very opposite. Stay tuned, you're gonna to wanna to hear this. Welcome back, folks. You know, in the last three years, we have seen changes in America that most people never dreamt could happen. Our culture is currently under siege by a woke agenda that are leaving even secular humanists scratching their heads in amazement. How did we get this far off course? Well, to those of you who have been listening to our program and reading our books, there is nothing happening that the Bible did not first warn us would happen in Babylon the Great. For the time being, the changes might not be affecting you personally, but I can assure you it's going to affect all of us in the very near future. Recently at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, Reverend Franklin Graham shared all the ups and downs he had experienced when he began his ministry. However, he warned all of us in ministry today that he felt like a storm was coming, a storm that nobody could stop nobody could control, but one which we all must prepare ourselves for. For those of us in the multimedia world, the storm would come to us first. He said we must have a backup plan for social media, for TV, and for every platform we use in communicating the gospel to our nation and around the world. Now, it was obvious to me that Franklin was hearing the same still small voice that Prophecy USA has been trying to shout from the rooftops for the last four years in our TV ministry. The storm is not coming, folks. The storm's already here. And the first blast of wind from that storm front is appearing in academia, in sports, and in our culture, and especially in our governments of Canada and the USA. So the big question is, how do we prepare? What should we be doing? Will God take care of us, or are we on our own? What part should we do, and what part will God do to bring us through the storm? You know, as believers, the first thing we need to do is turn to Scripture and see what has happened in the past that can prepare us for what's coming in the future. Listen to this. The Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. The Bible does not promise believers that we will not have difficulty in life. In fact, Jesus warned us of the very opposite. There is an adversary that everyone on earth must fight. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. One of the great advantages of being a believer is that God has promised us that when we walk in covenant with Him, He will not only warn us of coming problems, but He will make a way for each of us to be delivered from the enemy who creates them. Part of that deliverance plan is showcasing in scripture victories of the past that Satan is once again planning to do in the future. So was the case for Joseph when the Lord gave him an interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream. In this dream, Pharaoh saw seven fat cows and seven lean cows. Joseph, who was living in a jail cell at that time, was called into the palace and through divine revelation was given understanding of the dream. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty 
throughout all the land of Egypt. But there shall arise after them seven years of famine. God's servant Joseph was equipped by revelation knowledge and was put in charge of storing up food in Egypt for the coming famine. It was through his planning that Joseph's family was saved from starvation and God kept his Abrahamic covenant with the whole Jewish race. In this same pattern, Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egypt some 400 years later. Samson pulled down a pagan temple and killed 3,000 Philistines. Elijah called down fire on the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. David slew Goliath. Hezekiah watched 185,000 Assyrian soldiers slain by an angel in one night. And Daniel was cast into a lion's den. But when he was taken out, there was no manner of hurt upon him because he believed in God. There was one thing in common among these heroes of the faith. They believed in God. They walked in humility, carried out each task in obedience, and diligently maintained their personal covenant relationship that God had established with Abraham, the father of our faith. But what about today? Is God still able to deliver? Can he still overcome the enemy of our soul? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And with the coming storm that scripture says will come in the last days, is the covenant that these men walked in still available to us today? Welcome back, folks. I have with me today uh, my hostess and my wife, Karen. Karen, welcome to the program once again. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And Karen, uh, you have a question that came in from one of our viewers uh, that, that on our Thursday night prophecy podcast, people write in letters and emails. And this particular question fits right into our subject matter today. And I want our viewers to hear it. Uh, Karen, would you ask that question or just read that question? I think it was from Jack that came in. It was, I'm happy to Rick. Jack says, I have prayed with many pastors on religious programs for several years, and I always confess my sins and ask for forgiveness, but I have never tithed. Most of my life was spent earning minimum wage, and extra income was gained by working a second or third job, trying to make ends meet raising two children. Now I'm in my mid-70s, and I receive a low veteran's pension. I'm a Christian, and I follow the Lord, but I don't want to be left behind in the rapture. Please be direct and honest, Rick. Am I saved? Yours in Christ. Uh, Jack, thank you for that question. And I, I just want to let you know, Jack, we are not saved based on our works or by tithing, but on Christ's work on the cross. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I asked God to come into my heart when I was seven years old. However, at 32 years of age, I was making good money, but I was not tithing or giving 10% of my income to God's work. And upon conviction of the Holy Spirit, I began tithing by giving 10% of my net worth to medical missions uh, in third world nations. And it was immediately after I released those funds that I received the revelation of America's role in Bible prophecy. But the key factor is, is here that the Holy Spirit convicted me to start tithing. I suggest that if you feel led of the Lord, you should ask him what you can do from here on forward with regard to giving him a portion of your first fruits. And the last thing I wanna do uh, for you to get from my teaching is a heavy guilt trip, Jack. God understands your situation. He's not a tyrant. He has much grace to those who call on him. Now, Peter was asked for money, and he said to the lame man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You know, you may not have a lot of substance or money, but you have something that people are desperate for. You can give them a kind word, a helping hand, a word of encouragement or appreciation, the Holy Spirit will lead you to who and what you should give for his hand of blessings to flow through. Now, this is the covenant 
that these men of the past walked in, obedience to his voice will result in his covenant blessings to come upon you. And you've already blessed me, Jack, by writing me. So don't fear, Jack. His grace is sufficient. Now, folks, Karen has another question that will set the stage for the remaining of this program concerning the coming storm. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this next segment. Theological seminaries have inundated churches preaching that America is not in the Bible. Prophecy teachers have regurgitated for years that America is not in the Bible. But what does the Bible say? Prophecy USA is proud to present a 30-page brochure filled with scripture debunking the biggest lie keeping the body of Christ in darkness today. America is fully detailed in scripture over 53 times and now we want to put God's word directly into your hands. America's role in Bible prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled and her judgment is coming. For a gift of $15 plus shipping and handling, we will send you this amazing brochure. For a gift of $50, we will send you five brochures. For $100 or more, we will rush to you 10 brochures. And for a ministry gift of $500, we will send you both our books, The Hour That Changes Everything, and The Coming Exodus, plus 20 brochures for your friends, family, and relatives. Call today. Welcome back, folks. We're talking about preparing for the coming storm. And according to Scripture, the only way to prepare is by walking in covenant with God on a daily basis. Now, our next question helps us form the structure of the remainder of the program. Karen, you have that question. Could you I go do. ahead and read it? Thank you. This question is from Diane. She said, Rick, you have often said in your Thursday night prophecy podcast that you were a graduate of ORU and believed in the prosperity message. I will not name names, but several prosperity teachers have walked away from that teaching saying it's false. Are you still a prosperity believer? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Okay. Uh, you know, the chief proponent of the prosperity movement in our generation was Oral Roberts, but he never invented it. He discovered it in this Bible. Biblical prosperity is based on being in covenant with God. And Jesus gave us one of the biblical foundations for prosper prosperity in John 10.10. 10. It was at ORU that I learned the devil steals, but Jesus gives. The devil destroys, but Jesus saves. The devil kills, but Jesus gives life. The devil divides and subtracts, Jesus adds and multiplies. When the children of Israel entered the promised land, the Lord reminded them of his covenant with their father Abraham. He said, I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. However, there's a warning with that covenant promise. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish. Now we can get into trouble if we take our eyes off of God and are drawn away by other gods. So the question is, do you own your money or does your money own you? If your money owns you, then you've been drawn away by another the God of Mammon or Baal. This is what happened in America, which the Bible refers to as Babylon the Great. She falls into darkness, and so do many believers and teachers in the church. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. One of the building blocks of prosperity and of, and of overcoming the storm that's coming is found in 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Now there's three stages to prosperity which you must prioritize. Prosperity begins, number one, with your soul, your mind, and your emotions. 
Number two, it's your physical health. And number three, it's your financial well-being. Prosperity is not how much stuff you own. Instead, it's all about your relationship with God. The men in our documentary all overcame the storms coming against them because they had their priorities in order. And I think that many people in North America and in the church today have possibly gotten their priorities mixed up. Deuteronomy says, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and all that thou hast is multiplied, that thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God. And thou sayest in thy heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember in your mind that the Lord thy God, it is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. What happens when you don't let God direct your ways or your thoughts or your attitudes? For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, but prosperity of the fools shall destroy them. You know, the biggest test in life is not failure. It's actually success. When it comes to being called into ministry, one evangelist put it this way, some are sent and some just went. When it comes to being called into ministry, you have to ask yourself, what is your agenda? What is your motivation? If your only purpose for becoming an evangelist, a pastor, or a prophet is that you want to be blessed with many houses and with maybe money and fame, you're not called. You are not sent. You just went. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together. And running over shall men give unto your bosom. Now, most people in Scripture reluctantly received their callings from God. Every prophet gave an excuse of why they couldn't go into ministry. Moses said, here I am, Lord, but send Aaron. Jonah, the Lord said, get thee to Nineveh, and he took off the Tarshish. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. Paul was on his way to kill Christians, not save them, but God had another plan for Paul. So the question for those who abuse the prosperity message and get into ministry for all the wrong reasons is this. Are you genuinely trying to feed the sheep or are you building a career by fleecing the flock? Are you in the business of doing God's works are, or are you in the God business? Folks, God wishes above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God's will is for you to prosper His way, but not our way. God used the storm of global famine in the Old Testament to bring His Jewish family to Egypt, to show them that His ways are higher than our ways. Joseph's brothers were slave traders, liars, deceptive to their father, and would have been murderers if just one of the brothers hadn't stopped them from killing Joseph. And then Joseph, as a type of Jesus, literally forgave them when he said, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Folks, the devil brings the storm to harm you, but God uses the storm to show you his glory of guidance, provision, and protection. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, and I give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Karen, God sends us blessings so that they can go through you. Prosperity is God's idea, but man can pervert it. He can get his priorities wrong. So stay tuned, folks because the most important tool to get through this coming storm is in our next segment. Hello folks, Karen and I would like to personally thank you, our prayer partners, and our monthly supporters, 
who are helping us spread God's Word concerning America's role in Bible prophecy. In order to help you reach friends and other loved ones with this teaching, please listen to this very special message. In these end times, it is more important than ever to reach the lost. That's why Rick and Karen Pearson have assembled all of their teaching into this powerful study kit. For a gift of just $200 plus shipping and handling, Prophecy USA will send you a free study kit of five books, five study guides, and a DVD teaching aid discussing each chapter. Or for a gift of just $375 plus shipping and handling, you will receive a free study kit of 10 books, 10 study guides, and two DVD teaching aids. Call today at 1-888-306-1759 or visit us online at prophecyusa.org to send your gift and begin sharing these important prophetic teachings. Welcome back, folks. We're reading questions today from our Thursday night Prophecy Podcast Bible Studies concerning how to prepare for the coming storm. Now, Karen, I want to finish our teaching today with the conversation I had with a man from a men's fellowship. He approached me and was quite angry when he found out I believed that God wants to prosper the body of Christ. Do you remember that conversation? I certainly do. And you told me that this man's perception of Jesus was what traditional theology would have us believe to keep us in bondage. That's right. Uh, this man approached me and said, I don't believe in the prosperity message that the preachers are teaching today. My Jesus said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And I responded, sir, I discern in you that you are very much like Paul when he prayed that the life also of Christ might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Sir, you want to be like Jesus, am I correct? And he said, yes, that's my goal. I said, well, do you have a house? And he says, what do you mean? I said, do you have a house? He said, yes. Well, why do you have a house, I said. You just told me that Jesus didn't have a house and you want to be like Jesus. Well, you have to have a house, he said. I said, why? Jesus didn't have a house, and you want to be just like Jesus. You should sell your house if you want to be like Jesus, unless, of course, you're misinterpreting Scripture. Well, that is what the Bible says, Rick. Yes, I agree. You've studied where Jesus, or, or, or where the, the writer of that Scripture did say that Jesus didn't have a house, but he was on his way to Samaria, or excuse me, he was on his way through Samaria, on his way to Jerusalem. Samaria is halfway between Capernaum and Jerusalem. There were Jews in Samaria that had married Gentiles, and they hated the Jews in Jerusalem who were purebred Jews. Luke 9 says, when they heard he was going to Jerusalem, they did not receive him. Jesus at that point was on a road trip. He was evangelizing, working for the kingdom. The fact is that Jesus did have a house. It was in Capernaum. The first two disciples, Andrew and Peter, stayed with him when they asked, and they said, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And Jesus said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. You know, Jesus was a carpenter until he was 30 years old. Do you think he lived on the streets begging? No. In fact, some called him the carpenter from Galilee. And then I said to this man, do you know why I have a house? I said, I have a house because Jesus had a house. You know, the devil would love to have you think that Jesus was poor he went about destitute and homeless, asking for money, but that's not true, folks. And then I said, do you know why I have money? I said, because the Bible says Jesus had money. He had 12 disciples and he fed them every day. His ministry lasted approximately three years. If he provided three meals a day, to his 12 disciples, that's 36 meals a day. That's 182 meals a week, 9,000 meals a year. And according to scripture, 
When Jesus left, when Judas left Jesus to betray him, the disciples asked, for some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto them, buy those things that we have need against the feast. Or perhaps he was going to use that bag to go give something to the poor. Jesus used money to buy food for his disciples, and he also gave money to the poor. Jesus had enough money that he even had a bookkeeper to keep track of it. Jesus had money. He was not poor. The religious people didn't like that, but Jesus didn't care. He was about his father's business, and his priorities were right. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You know, when your priorities are in line with God's will, he will use you as a channel of blessing. When Jesus needed to pay his taxes, he told his disciples to just go fishing. Jesus knew that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, a, a minister friend of mine told me a life lesson that he had learned from 40 years of ministry. He said, there are many good loving believers who don't care if they have much money, but it really bothers them if someone else does. Now, Jesus wore nice clothes during his ministry. This is why they cast lots for his garment, because he wore a seamless robe. Folks, you cannot be like Jesus until you first know what the real Jesus was actually like. He was not poor. He was not religious. He was not steeped in traditional thought theology. Jesus knows who Babylon the Great is. He knows that in Revelation 17, 13, the hatred of the woke agenda of the last days or the beast system shall have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for his Lord of lords and kingdom kings. And they that are with them are called chosen and faithful. To be like Jesus means that you have your priorities in line. Jesus overcame the storms of life and you can overcome your storms in life by being like him and by having a life. And according to Jesus, it will be a life of abundance. Our nation is in big trouble, but you don't have to be. Babylon has fallen and become the habitation of every foul and unclean spirit, but you are called and chosen and faithful. The devil thinks he's gonna scare us because of the coming storm, but what God and Jesus has proven over and over and over again in those covenant commandments that we should not fear the storm because we are the storm. Folks, we're out of time. This is Prophecy USA. This is Rick and Karen Pearson, and we're reminding you that God is in control. Jesus Christ is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people realize. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom. Shalom.